Living in Harmony is possible if you know your emotions and how to handle them. I am Dr. Carmen Roman, and I will share with you the current psychology by myself or by interviewing experts who will inspire you. Learn how to live a life of fullness and how to recover your emotional harmony. Welcome to Emotions in Harmony. Hello, my dear Amigos in Harmony, how are you? This time we are really happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> this time we are really happy um, uh, talking about Spencer Christian's life. <laughs> yeah. It's good to be with you. Thank you. And I'm happy to, to talk mm -hmm. about my life. I'm glad you're interested in it. <laughs> I am very interested. Um, as you guys uh, listened, probably by the time you listen this interview, I, we talk about uh, gambling in Spanish and gambling in English. You have all the information there, the psychological and clinical information there. You have it. Um, and if you want the details or whatever, go there. This interview is about fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah? that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I am very honored to have Christian Spencer and you have here uh, the book, Run to the Store, Run to Amazon and get it because Christian, after couple years of not reading books because I am only into podcasts now. Mm -hmm. uh, my brain got born after the PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I can imagine. I haven't read a book fully and very interested until this one. Thank you. I, I feel honored. I feel you told me that when we first met. You yeah. said you had not been reading books for a while, but for a while? but you found this one interesting. Yeah. So I, I feel quite honored. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I really was like really enjoying. You have a beautiful way of writing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Well, I, I feel that um, I'm very fortunate. I've had some um, rich life experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean rich in the grand sense. I don't mean in terms yeah. of money. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to share my life experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have many stories to tell that I thought might inspire or uplift or help other people. I uh, am or sure. might maybe even amuse and entertain them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Sometimes out of entertainment or amuse comes some trans transformation too. Yes, that's so, true. Uh, we are opening the set just for you to talk about your life. And yeah. of course, uh, we will have a conversation and whatever. But I really want people to know the Spencer behind the cameras. OK. Uh, well, I'll start with my early life. I, mm -hmm. I grew up in Virginia, in a rural town in Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, in the old racially segregated uh, south, you know, in the in the southern states. Uh, I, I was born in 1947, so mm -hmm. um, I, I'm turning 72 this year. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, from the time of my birth up until I was nearly 20 years old, uh, there were laws throughout all the southern states, including Virginia, where I grew up, uh, that um, required rigid racial segregation. So if you were black, if you were a person of any color other than Caucasian, uh, you couldn't go into the restaurants, you couldn't use the water fountains uh, in, a, in, in public facilities. You couldn't use the same restrooms. Mm -hmm. um, every, every, you, you just didn't have equal rights. We were second class citizens. Um, and so every day of my life uh, throughout my youth, I was uh, living in a society that told me that I had to stay in a s s certain place, in a limited place. My opportunities were limited. I was not treated equally under the law. Um, and in fact, as if that weren't bad enough, that uh, black people couldn't go into the same restaurants or the movie theaters or the restaurants or the same schools as whites. Um, there were also um, uh, attacks, physical attacks. Uh, people were, were being lynched or, or brutally beaten because they showed up in a place where they should not be. Mm -hmm. um, so, but despite the, the ugliness of mm -hmm. that, the, the uh, injustice of that, the evil of that kind of system. My parents, who were remarkable people, somehow instilled in my brother and me this belief that we could overcome this, that um, uh, more opportunities were, were coming if we could just work hard and be prepared to embrace these new opportunities when they came, that uh, we were going to have a, a better world. They believed in the American dream, and they were people of great faith. You know, uh -huh. They taught us to pray and to lean on God and to uh, uh, you know, ask him for the strength and guidance to uh, deal with adversity and to overcome it. Well, by the late 1960s, 
when I was approaching uh, age 20, uh, civil rights bills had been passed and laws had been passed that were uh, uh, guaranteeing equal rights. Uh, very often we had to still fight to go to court to, to, to gain those rights, but at least the laws changed. So I, I, <laughs> these opportunities my parents kept telling us would someday come our way mm -hmm. finally opened up. Mm -hmm. And um, because I had been given by my parents such a positive, uh, hopeful, aspirational approach to life, um, rather than look back with bitterness at how I had been treated before, I embraced these new opportunities with, you know, with a positive, hopeful attitude. So I was in college in the late 1960s. Uh, I worked in political campaigns um, and uh, decided I wanted to become a journalist. So once uh, all those barriers that had been there uh, were removed and I knew that I could go out and compete for, it, for the job or the, or the career of my choice, uh, I began looking for a job as a news reporter and I got my first job as a television news reporter in 1970 in Richmond, wow. Virginia. Uh -huh. um, and once uh, I was on the air and embarking on this new career, uh, the, the whole, a, a new world of opportunity opened up to me. So that, that's my early life. That's, um, uh -huh. By the time I began my TV career, I had, I had uh, gotten married um, and um, I was on the air in Richmond, Virginia. I, I gained a certain level of uh, uh, recognition mm -hmm. and prominence, and I started getting offers from uh, television stations in larger markets. So in a very short time, in a few years, by the mid-1970s, I ended up in New York working for ABC. Uh, by that time, my wife and I were ha uh, uh, raising a family. We had uh, uh, two children, uh, a boy and a girl from the, late, uh, from the mid to late 1970s. Um, by the mid-1980s, I had moved on to national TV on Good Morning America with ABC. And in the 80s and 90s, uh, that was uh, my, my job on, on Good Morning America. But, but, but um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to yeah, ask questions sure. just Please because jump I can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you do? Did you notice that you learned the English accent or did uh, you took special classes for that? I did not. Uh, when I was a very young child, I, mm -hmm. I recognized, I was aware mm -hmm. that most people around me in the South had this mm -hmm. Southern accent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but when I watched TV, I noticed that the people on TV didn't have that kind of accent. Mm -hmm. They sounded more polished to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> they sounded more refined mm -hmm. uh, or more sophisticated, whatever the right word is. And I decided I wanted to, I wanted to sound like those people, not the people uh -huh. <laughs> around me. <laughs> so uh -huh. as a young child, I was very conscious of the language and, mm -hmm. and how, how I sounded when I spoke. So I, I grew up on my own without any kind of regional accent, uh -huh. yeah. which was helpful to me when yeah, I started I, I my career. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. But um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, even as my career was taking off and I was moving up to national TV and uh, you know, providing a, a great um, a life for my family, uh, I fell into uh, a gambling uh -huh. problem, a gambling addiction. Uh, and that gambling addiction stayed with me for nearly 30 years. And even though I um, uh, invested my, myself fully in the role of being a father and a husband, and even though I worked hard at my career mm -hmm. and never missed a day of work, um, I was, th this gambling problem was so uh, destructive, so uh -huh. devastating that it was almost all consuming. I mean, I, I began to fall into a lot of debt I fell behind on federal income taxes, uh, had problems with the IRS, uh, I was constantly borrowing money. Uh, I took good care of my family, I always paid my bills, but because of all the money I lost gambling, I was constantly worried about uh, the debt that I had accumulated. And I started to feel foolish, I started mm -hmm. to feel guilty, and I was ashamed of myself, mm -hmm. and, I, and I kept the, the gambling problem pretty much a secret. I mean, my friends and my colleagues at work knew that I liked to go to the casinos. They uh -huh. knew that I liked to take my, my family and friends to, to Las Vegas on a, on a weekend vacation. Um, but they didn't realize that I, I had this compulsion and that I was uh, living on the, on the verge of financial ruin. Um, they just saw me as this happy guy who enjoyed his work and was on TV every day having fun. Um, 
So th this was something that, that a, a problem I wrestled with for nearly 30 years before I was able to, to find my Did way out. Did you have anybody who show a concern or like a family member or a friend say, hey, Christian Spencer, this something that you are doing or well, my be careful or something? Yeah, M my wife showed concern. Okay. She began to realize after a few years that um, my gambling was excessive and that it, was, it wasn't it was just something I enjoyed doing once in a while, that mm -hmm. it was, uh, it, that it had, um, it, it was controlling me. Mm -hmm. um, so every once in a while she would sit down and say, uh, honey, I think you need to l take a look at your behavior here. I mean, your bills are mounting up and you're always borrowing money and I'm just worried. So we had those conversations, mm -hmm. uh, but I had convinced myself because I didn't want to acknowledge that I had a problem. I had convinced myself that uh, I was just um, enjoying expensive recreation mm -hmm. um, and that, that because I was earning a lot of money and I thought of myself as being a resourceful person, I would find a way to deal with it and get things back in order. Mm -hmm. um, and then because I had convinced myself of that, I would also make that argument to her, oh no, it's going to be okay, you know, mm -hmm. I'll find a way to work things out. But uh, she was the only person in the early stages of my gambling who recognized how big a problem it was. I think my, my friends at work uh, knew that I was a fun-loving guy and I loved uh, you know, going to the casinos for a weekend of fun. And uh, w because I was uh, a high roller, you know, a, a VIP mm -hmm. gambler, I was gambling at a, at a high level, um, I, I, was, I always received that VIP treatment from the casinos. They would uh, give, my, give me and my family a big luxury suite, you know, a penthouse suite to stay in, uh, and gourmet meals at the restaurants, and uh, front row tickets to all the, the uh, shows and sporting events, um, because they knew I was going to gamble at a high level in the casinos, so I didn't have to pay for any of that. And because mm -hmm. I enjoyed that, that kind of treatment, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I would take my friends with, with us on a, a little vacation to Las Vegas or to Atlantic City or wherever the casino venue was, and, and all my friends could see was that we were getting this VIP treatment and we were going to these amazing shows and we were having these wonderful meals. They didn't think about, they, I don't think they ever saw uh, in me uh, a sign that I had a problem. Uh, a so sign of a stress or anxiety or... Mm -hmm. uh, that's right, stress or yeah. anxiety. I yeah. was feeling stress and anxiety mm -hmm. all the time, yeah. but, but it, didn't, it didn't show on the surface. Mm -hmm. So the only, only person who really knew in the early years was my wife. But then maybe 10, 15, 20 years into it, um, when I was constantly looking for ways to keep my uh, financial, my, my finances in order, I was constantly borrowing money from here to pay off debt over there. Um, when it got to that point, there were a couple of personal friends I went to when I could no longer borrow money from the banks. Mm -hmm. And I would work out some kind of loan with them and they would, they would say, but you know, you're earning a lot of money and uh, I thought you were doing so well. What's what's the problem? What's mm -hmm. happened here? Uh, why aren't you able to go to the bank? And um, I would conf I confided in a couple of them that I had hit a losing streak, you know, in my gambling, and uh, I, I didn't want to go to the bank and let the banks know that mm -hmm. that gambling was my problem. So they would make me a big loan, and of course I always paid them back. I I, I always. Um, wanted to show that I was honorable and trustworthy. So I always found a way to pay them back. Uh, and then I, I think they would just forget about it and assume that I was okay now, and that I, I had fixed my problem. This is what I observe in the families that I work with, uh, Spencer. I observe that there is a wave or there is a uh, season where the gambler is happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's everybody's happy, they are spending together. Um, I have the story of a couple of years ago, I have a little girl who is a very low income, very, very low income girl and came to a session with something, I remember a toy or something that was expensive. And it was like, I asked, hey, how you got this? And she said, I got it in Vegas. Mm. And like, uh, how you go to Vegas? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she said, well, my parents took me and my daddy gave me a hundred dollars bill to spend. And that was a family that a hundred dollar will be their eating for the week. It's a lot of money. It was yeah. a lot of money yeah. and it was like, oh, okay. So I start getting the family, getting the mother and slowly getting the father and then learning more about them. And 
and the feeling is we are happy. Yeah. And I am, the girl was, I'm very happy when my daddy go to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And we all have a good time. Yeah. But then they don't recognize this kind of a, a hole that they are digging. That's right. It's very late when they recognize that. Yeah. My, my children began to recognize it when they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when they were much younger, uh, you know, they knew they were getting on the plane to go on a trip with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, we would, if we, we took a vacation, we, we lived in the New York area most mm -hmm. of my career, but we would come out to California on vacation. Mm -hmm. And then on the way back home, we'd stop in Las Vegas for three or four days. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever I would win, I would do a lot of special things, you know, for the kids or send my wife on a shopping spree. Mm -hmm. um, but when I would lose, I would try to present the same kind of um, image, you know, happy image mm -hmm. to them. But mm -hmm. deep down inside, yeah. there was so much stress and anxiety. By the time my children were 14, 15 years old, they knew that I had a gambling problem. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, my, my son found it difficult to talk about it because he didn't want me to feel like he uh, was being critical or, yes. yeah, or that, yeah. you know, that he didn't uh, respect me anymore. It's but very sensitive, it's very to, sensitive. to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. it is. But my, my daughter somehow mm -hmm. would occasionally find the right words. Mm -hmm. You know, she would say, Dad, I'm just concerned. You know, I know you're having fun, but I'm just concerned. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to tell you what to do with mm -hmm. your life. I, interestingly enough, when I finally reached a point in my life uh, nearly 10 years ago, mm -hmm. when I started to uh, feel like I, I don't want this in my life anymore, yeah. uh, it was my daughter. It was a conversation with my daughter mm -hmm. that was the turning point. Uh -huh. you know? By this time, she was you know, an adult. Uh -huh. uh, my daughter is 41 years old now, so at this point she was about 32, um, and uh, she came out to visit me here in California um, at, from the East Coast, and uh, we were sitting down after dinner just, just having a father-daughter conversation, and she said, um, Dad, you know that I'm getting engaged and I'll be getting married soon, and I plan to bring grandchildren into your life. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, I, I want, I'm really concerned about the path that you're on in life. I worry about you. Uh, she said, you know that there are so many things about you that I admire and respect, mm -hmm. but um, she said, I want you to ask yourself if the way you're living your life now is the way you want your grandchildren to see you. Is this the behavior you want to model for them? Uh, she said, uh, you, you know, you've overcome so many difficulties in life, you know, growing up in the old segregated South, being poor, um, and, and you moved into a, a profession um, that is very competitive and very few people reach mm -hmm. the level of success that you've had and you, you met that challenge. But I, wanted, I want you to, to defeat this gambling thing also and, and get that out of your life. And um, it was just, it was a turning point. That was the, the point when I knew I didn't want gambling in my life anymore and I wanted to uh, be honest and acknowledge my problem uh -huh. and see if I could if I could oh. conquer it. I'm so glad you are sharing about this conversation with your daughter because one of my questions is what your family members said or did that helped you to get better. Yeah. And that was this honest conversations. I am concerned you may be not doing the right thing. That's it's right. your life. Seems like your daughter didn't took your power from you. It's like you are the one who decide but you're so right. That, that's true. Mm -hmm. she, she didn't approach the conversation in a way that, mm -hmm. that made me feel like she was taking the mm -hmm. power away from me or that she was being the parent and talking yeah. to me like a child. She expressed her love and mm -hmm. respect, uh, and she talked about the things that she admired in my character. Mm -hmm. um, and, she, and she talked about um, how she recognized the challenges I had faced in my life and how I had overcome so many challenges. But then she reminded me that this problem that I had, the gambling problem, mm -hmm. was not something that was imposed on me uh -huh. by, by the outside world. It was a problem I mm -hmm. imposed on myself. Yeah. It was a, a self-made problem. And she, and she basically said, I know that you have the strength and the ability and the mm -hmm. faith mm -hmm. to overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. So love from around is important. Yes. Yeah. So important. I. Um, I've seen so many people with gambling problems because I spent so much time in casinos. Yeah. Um, so many people who didn't have the support group mm -hmm. around them um, to, to 
provide them that unconditional love. Yeah. Um, and, and I've also seen problem gamblers who had people close to them who cared about them but expressed it with anger or rage or, uh, or threatening, like, mm -hmm. if you don't quit, I'm going to leave, that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, I, I was so fortunate that wasn't the way my support group, my loved mm -hmm. ones, um, uh, communicated with me. They communicated love and concern um, first. And, and that made me uh, become more, more introspective, you know, to look mm -hmm. at myself more honestly. And let me, is, is, I, I want to be successful and describe what I see yeah. when I work with somebody who gambles. It's like their mind is like this hummingbird. Yeah. It's so fast. Yes. Yeah, that uh, as a psychologist, I need to be able to catch up yeah. Yeah. some information and, and I have seconds to say something that it will be impactful. I have so much respect for the mind of the gambling because yeah. they are looking for opportunities. That's right. It's like That's they are opportunists and they find opportunities, but, but then to somebody who relates, they need to find mm -hmm. this opportunity to express their love and concern. Wh what you said is so mm -hmm. true. I, um, mm -hmm. The thing, uh, the, the feeling that I got from gambling in those early mm -hmm. years was this feeling of excitement and uh, euphoria, and it was mm -hmm. it was almost like a drug. I, I did, I've never used drugs, but mm -hmm. I, from what I've heard drug addicts describe, mm -hmm. this was the feeling I got from gambling. And and my mind was like you said, constantly racing, mm -hmm. uh, trying to figure out ways to win and ways to to beat the game. Mm -hmm. And then once I started sinking into uh, debt mm -hmm. and having financial problems, my mind was constantly f trying to figure out how to deal with it, how to how to put things in balance. Mm -hmm. Where can I go to borrow money next? Uh, and whenever I was, I felt like I was being confronted mm -hmm. w w by anyone uh, yeah. with, you know, what are you doing with yourself? My mind was working quickly to come up with excuses. Oh, really yeah. child excuses. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're right about the mind uh -huh. of a gambler, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I have I a have couple clients that they are just like fast in yeah. saying, uh, no, I don't have a problem, yeah? yeah? Denial, like, yeah. Did I, did I don't pay my rent for my family, the rent for my family? Did I don't pay the expenses? Like, no, you did. Mm -hmm. You did, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. what I always tell them is, what is the time that you are um, taking away from your family? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I, I was, you know, I, I was always determined when I realized uh, how much time I was investing in gambling to try to match that, you know, with time mm -hmm. spent with my kids yeah. so that I wouldn't feel guilty that, that like I had deprived them or neglected them. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, the time I invested in gambling and the, it, the physical energy and the emotional energy, uh, it, it was, I, I just can't believe it now when I look back on it. I don't know how I survived that and maintained my health. Uh, not to mention the loss of money. So I lost time. Mm -hmm. uh, I lost. Um, I lost connection. You know, mm -hmm. with with the people I cared about most, and the people who cared most about me. Mm -hmm. And I lost a fortune. I lost so much money. I, there was a uh, one point uh, in the mid 1980s where I was in so much debt from gambling that I had fallen far behind on federal income taxes. And because I was unable to satisfy the IRS demands mm -hmm. to pay my back taxes, uh, the IRS seized the, the home that I lived in with my family wow. um, and forced us to move out mm -hmm. and they sold that house at, a, at an auction. And that, I mean, you would think that would have been the wake up call I needed, right? Mm -hmm. to, to get me to stop gambling. Well, I stopped for a short time, just long enough to settle with the IRS and move my family into another mm -hmm. house. It was maybe uh, eight or 10 months, not quite a year. And b once I, I started to feel like I was back on my feet again and I was in control again, I went right back to gambling. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I also went through a, a bankruptcy. Uh, what, what, yeah. what do you think it was? Like, you say, okay, we lose the house. Yeah. Now we have really big problems. Yeah. Economic. Um, what, what, what was, I want, I want to get into your mind yeah, yeah. and see what, what was the explanation for you to say, I can do one more night or? Well, when, uh, when the problems with the IRS first came up and, and I knew I was being audited and they were demanding you know, something like $365,000 <laughs> in back taxes, 
uh, you know, I had negotiations, I tried to work out a settlement. And once I realized they were not going to settle with me and they took my house, uh, fortunately I was able to, to move my family into a rental property that was uh, almost as nice mm -hmm. as the house that we had lost because my earnings were high enough that I could m manage that. Mm -hmm. um, but then I had to uh, look at all the other debts that I had because of the gambling and I, I couldn't manage all of those debts so I went through a bankruptcy. Uh, now that bankruptcy didn't erase my debt. It, didn't, didn't, it certainly did not erase the IRS debt. What it did was it, uh, it uh, discharged all the debts that I had to casinos. So all mm -hmm. those casino credit lines where I owed 20,000 here and mm -hmm. 15,000 there, that all got wiped out. So that gave me a feeling like I can, I can start all over again now. So I did quit uh, at that point for, I, as I said, maybe eight to 10 months. Mm -hmm. I quit gambling, my wife was happy, mm -hmm. uh, I was devoting more time to my family and of course to work. But as soon as I got to the point where the IRS was paid off now and my other debts were manageable and I was getting money in my pocket again, uh, I was tempted to go right back to the casinos because I had convinced myself that now that I've been through this difficulty uh, and I survived, I'm in control. Now I can gamble, you know, at a, at a <laughs> I don't know if there's such a thing as gambling at a moderate pace, but, <laughs> if I, but I can keep it in moderation and uh -huh. not let it control me. But I was wrong, of course. So I, that's the mind, that's the, the explanation is I can gamble at a moderate pace. Right, that's exactly right. I can right. just sit and do a thousand dollars or two thousand. Yeah, I can set a limit, right. Uh -huh. But, but I, would never, I never stuck to those limits. Mm -hmm. I, and I, when I first started going back to the casinos after the bankruptcy, mm -hmm. um, I would say to myself, okay, I'll take a limited amount of money and mm -hmm. if I lose that, then I quit. But very shortly after I started gambling again, the casino started offering me credit lines again, mm -hmm. even though I had defaulted on the earlier yeah. credit lines. And so when I was losing, I would say, wh whenever I would lose what was in my pocket, mm -hmm. I would say, okay, I'll take out a, a, a credit Another marker. Credit. Yeah, and it, it started all over again. What I see is a lot of uh, strength and resourcefulness because mm -hmm. um, you were like, okay, we lose the house, we have a new house, yeah. Uh, you never abandon your family in that. No. In that. No. So that sense of the strength and reformness is like, it's also inviting to, I can take care so I can go back and gamble one, two thousand more. Right. Yeah. That, that's true. It's a, it's a, um, a blessing and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, a blessing and a curse. The re that resourcefulness, you're uh -huh. right, it certainly is. Um, you know, uh, there were so many lessons from early childhood that stayed with me throughout my life uh -huh. uh, that uh, were the, the values or the, the teachings that I leaned on whenever I, I found myself in any difficult situation in life. Uh -huh. So in, in, the, in the worst moments when I was dealing with my gambling problem and with the debt, with the uh, stress and the anxiety, uh -huh. uh, I was still praying. I still felt the presence of God in my life. Mm -hmm. I still leaned on those uh, basic uh, values that my parents taught me as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, confront your problem honestly. Don't blame other people for your problems mm -hmm. if you know that your problems are self-created. Um, and e even though all those values stayed with me, I still gambled for 30 years. It was still three decades before mm -hmm. I w decided I'm going to get this out of my life and I'm going to live a more purposeful life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the, the person my parents encouraged me to be or the, the person my, kid, my children want me to be or the person God created me to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it took me 30 years to learn that lesson, to get to that point. Well, <laughs> better two years than nothing. That's true. <laughs> That's true. One thing my parents uh, always said to me and, and to my brother when we were growing up is don't identify yourselves as victims. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you read that in the book, didn't you? Yes, yeah. yes, I like this, yeah. this sentence because it really gives you the power back. That's right. Don't, you are not a victim. That's right. Uh, and they, they were very wise people. They, they didn't have a lot of formal mm -hmm. education, but they were wise and they said, other people may try to victimize you. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly the, the circumstances I faced growing up in the old segregated South uh, were circumstances that that victimized me in different ways. But they said, but don't identify yourself as a victim. That's not who you are. You're, you're much more than that. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, if you start to um, blame everyone else for your problems, then you won't accept responsibility for those failures that were your fault, those, those stumbles or those, those mistakes that were mm -hmm. your fault. 
And that, that stayed with me for all of my life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, my, one of my main, my main work is working with victims of crime. Mm -hmm. And try the way they work, victim is just, yeah, it's somebody come and do something to you, therefore you are a victim. Yeah. yeah. But it's different than behaving like a victim. Right. It's just very different. Yeah. So my work is to help them to feel the empowerment and get back on their feet with the less damage, emotional damage possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So if we can we can make a case for your gambling and a very actually solid case that um, the system, the casinos do their job, very mm -hmm. good job in creating the atmosphere right. for somebody to keep gambling. Like it doesn't make sense that somebody already is in bankruptcy and we offer more credit line, yeah. So there is a good solid case outside that it was a, a dance. That's yeah. true. It was a society dance and and I, what I was what I am reading about the literature is somebody is more likely to gamble if they start at young age. Yeah. That's and true. if it's part of their social life. Yeah. That's true. I started in my late late twenties. I was twenty eight, twenty nine, mm -hmm. something like almost thirty. Yeah. Um, and it was it was a social thing at first, mm -hmm. you know. But but you're right. The, cre the casinos create an environment that is electric. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, you know, you walk in there and and you just feel high. Yeah. Um, and and then once you start playing, uh, there are certain inducements that are offered to encourage you to play at a higher level to gamble for for more money, um, that's when the, the comps come in, you know, yeah. the complimentary meal or the complimentary mm -hmm. room or the suite or the tickets to the shows. Um, and th now, in saying that, I'm not blaming the casinos for my problem. Yeah. They're in a business and they know how to uh, of course. offer a product that's very attractive that mm -hmm. will make you keep coming back. Um, and, and that's where you know the individual's self-control comes into play. Yeah, and as we say to teenagers, if you are going to your bunch of friends who smoke marijuana, you are most likely That's right. will end up. So no, we don't blame the circumstances, but definitely we recognize that the circumstances are enticing. That's very enticing. They are uh, inviting and you know, it's like making you feel like everything is good yeah. and life will be good. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Very, it's mm -hmm. very enticing. I, you know, you, you talked about the social aspect. I can remember very clearly um, trips to the casino, for weekend trips that my wife and I made with other couples, mm -hmm. or that I made with just a bunch of guys who were friends of mine. Uh, none of them were were. Um, none of them had the same problem I had. They loved to gamble, but at a certain point, when they were get tired and go to bed. I was still there at the tables gambling all night, uh -huh. uh, and uh, it's, uh, I had this, um, this uh, compulsion to chase my losses. That's a common mm -hmm. term in mm -hmm. gambling, chasing losses. Um, m many of my friends who gambled would quit at a certain point and say, well, this is not my night. I'll just go mm -hmm. get some rest. But I would never quit. I would always uh, keep trying for that, that comeback, for, for mm -hmm. things to turn around. Mm -hmm. They don't turn around. <laughs> they don't turn around. No, they don't. It doesn't happen. For whoever is listening, it, no. it doesn't happen. <laughs> the, only, the best turnaround is when you turn around and walk away. That's, yes. that's the turnaround. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your very rich life in work, because that's something um, very important. Is the idea that somebody gambling or somebody in an, any kind of addiction is that they have poor emotional life, and sometimes it's not true. That's true. I, no, I had a, a great emotional life apart from mm -hmm. the anxiety and the stress uh, that I felt because of all the debt that created through the gambling. Mm -hmm. I still, my life was so rich in so many other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my personal family life was great because I loved my wife and my kids, and yeah, you know, I, I have a wonderful relationship with my kids now mm -hmm. and my grandchildren. Um, and I had a job that was a dream job. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was uh, one of the three principal co-hosts on Good Morning America for mm -hmm. 13 years from wow. the, the mid 80s to the late 1990s. Uh, I did weather, um, mm -hmm. but I, did report, I reported on a wide range of other topics. Uh, I met and interviewed all the people in the news from fields of politics and entertainment and sports and the arts. Um, I've traveled to all 50 states on various assignments. I've traveled to five different continents across the world mm -hmm. on various ass work-related assignments. So I, I've had a richly rewarding career mm -hmm. for which I'm very thankful. 
Um, and I, and I, you know, I'm, I, I mean, I'm humble about this. I'm not, th I'm not saying this mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. boastful way when I talk yeah. about my career. I'm saying it in a thankful way. You know, I'm grateful that these opportunities have come my way. I've met and interviewed six U.S. presidents. I've formed a personal friendship with Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. I was a personal friend of Muhammad Ali. Um, so the, um, the, the uh, foundation in life that my parents gave me when I was young, the direction that they gave me in mm -hmm. life, uh, has really paid off, you know. Um, but despite all these wonderful, joyful things I had in my life, uh, there was this self-destructive path that I was on for so long. And how I kept the two in balance, I, I don't know, other than um, I had a lot of love around me. And, mm -hmm. and that love gave me a lot of joy. And my career gave me a, a great sense of fulfillment and joy. Mm -hmm. So in my darkest moments, when I felt uh, like I had nowhere to turn, I knew I could turn to the joy and the love that I got from my family yeah. and the joy that my, my career gave me. And also that you are pretty smart, so probably you are like, we talk about resources, you are like, I need to keep my job, I need yeah, to oh keep yeah. the income, I need to keep the way of living. I like, see, you are s almost 72 and you yeah. pretty much are in, in your feet, on your feet very well. I, and I'm still still working uh -huh. <laughs> in, a, in a career that I love, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a prominent role. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very fortunate. So it, se it seems like you went for three years to a war with a monster and, <laughs> and then you win. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <That's>, uh, yes. <laughs> I'm the victor. Yeah. Yes, yes. And those monsters are inside. That, that's, you know, they are that's the worst. That, that's true. That's yeah. true. Well, uh, you know, I've tried so hard to um, understand what it was uh, about gambling that, that kept me going at it for so long. I mean, initially it was the excitement mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the prospect of winning. But after many years went by, 15, 20, 25 mm -hmm. years, you know, what was it that kept me to that propelled me to keep going forward, trying to recoup my losses. I think I figured it out, I think. Okay, I mean, right. oh, so in tell my me because I have my own theories. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I want to hear your theories too. <laughs> so in my, in my early life, all of my life, I have mm -hmm. um, uh, at various times had to overcome challenges and adversity. Mm -hmm. So in my early life, obviously, the challenges of growing up in the old segregated South, and uh, somehow I was able to survive and overcome that. I was always competitive in academics, I was competitive in sports, I played baseball in college. Uh, I've always been used to meeting challenges and winning in the mm -hmm. end. Um, then I moved into a very competitive career mm -hmm. where very, very few people reach a certain level of yeah. prominence. And, and yet, you know, I, 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 I won that battle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so gambling was the first thing I didn't have, seem to have the ability to, to defeat. I just couldn't beat it. Yeah. And I just wanted to keep going at it, keep going at it, because something inside me said, you can beat this too, you can, you can win. But I couldn't win against that. And mm -hmm. I finally had to recognize that I could not win. And that's the hard part. Yeah. yeah? It's like, I am stopped trying. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So what's your theory? That was, <laughs> that was one of my theories, that yeah. the, the need for competition, but yeah. the need to keep your brain working. Yeah. The need is like, oh, this is challenging, That's entertaining. Right. I yeah. will be here, yeah? If we could put your brain into studying something, you probably will be creating a, something to go in the NASA or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> same <laughs> amount of energy and, and stuff. So the need for competition, but also. That makes sense. The high levels of stress yeah. of your job. Everybody expressed their stress in different ways. Yeah. And yeah, you say it's one of the jobs and looks a happy moment there. But I can imagine the levels of stress working for TV. It, it is a very stressful profession, um, but I think, I, I don't know what it is in my mm -hmm. psychological makeup that has equipped me to handle that stress so well. But I look at most of my colleagues and I can see the effect mm -hmm. of the stress on them. They worry about the ratings, they worry about the next contract. Mm -hmm. um, I've been so fortunate that I, I just, I don't have that worry. I've just always felt that if I'm an effective communicator and I go out there and do the job in a way that um, allows me to make a personal connection mm -hmm. with the viewers, that that's going to get me the next opportunity, get me the next contract. So I don't... I so that was not your stress? Uh, yeah, not so, so much. So it was out of bother, b but, bore? You were bored? 
Uh, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm bored. I am going to yeah, yeah, put my ability here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, mm -hmm. I just recognized early in my career that many of my um, colleagues were making themselves crazy, uh -huh. worried, worrying all the time about every little thing. You know, uh -huh. what, what were the ratings like this month, and um, you know, uh, how many fan letters did I get? Mm -hmm. uh, I, those things never bothered me. I guess I just focused on doing my job and having fun. Mm -hmm. While I'm doing the job, mm -hmm. and and the well, well, I'm very fortunate. I work in a in a in a job where I get feedback every day from mm. from my consumers. If yeah, you yeah, will, right. Uh -huh. uh, so the the TV audience uh -huh. uh, is made up of my consumers. So I don't have to have uh, someone do some research to see what the profit margin is. When I walk out on the street mm -hmm. or go to the grocery store or go to the pharmacy, and people come up to me and say, "Oh, I watched you do the weather last night. I, you know, I, uh -huh. I like what you do." then that gives me, gives me the confidence that I don't have to worry and be stressed out all the time. I, I read that they actually send you gloves and hats and oh, whatever yeah. when you were in the storms. And yeah. Oh <laughs> my God, how cute. When, when people see me out in the weather, <laughs> uh -huh. in, in unpleasant weather, you uh -huh. know, they, if, if I look cold, people would send me gloves and hats, uh, uh, uh -huh. umbrellas. Uh -huh. uh, I, I still get gifts. Viewers send me gifts all the time. Uh -huh. uh, it's That's cute. Yeah, it is cute. It <laughs> so. is. I mean, I, I feel like um, I've got a lot of friends out there I don't uh -huh. even know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I like m for my theories not to be the ones. Yeah, it's, it's okay because mm. psychology is just a bunch of people writing books together, but n it can never be about one person. Yeah, yeah. Psychology can say whatever, your life is another thing. Yeah. yeah. So the other, and, and I already shared with you before the interview this, and you say no, so I want to say it. Um, the other idea that I have is by growing, growing up poor, mm -hmm. the family constellations therapy say, um, we, want, we have the sense of loyalty to our families. Yes. So if I get rich, would happen with so many people that earn the lottery ticket or whatever, they, they, they win the lottery. By by spending everything and becoming poor again, is my sense of loyalty of belonging to my family. Right. So, but you say no. So no, tell well, me. Well, I understand <laughs> that because uh -huh. I think that applies to the vast majority of people mm -hmm. who come from poverty and mm -hmm. and suddenly you know uh -huh. earn a lot of money and mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and I, so I think that's a, a very um, sound psychological profile, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it applies to no, me. No, it doesn't, no, okay. No. Because, <laughs> uh, well, you know, once I started making a uh, certain amount of money, I, w I wanted to build my parents a new house and give them a dream house oh, and did nice. that for them. Uh -huh. And I wanted to uh, provide well for my family. Uh -huh. And I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to uh, live a life that would make my parents proud and, and uh, make all the people who encouraged me, my mentors, and when encouraged me along the way, uh -huh. proud of me that I had lived up to their, their expectations. So there, I certainly wasn't conscious of anything that made me want to continue to relate to being poor. So your parents were happy that you were earning those amounts of money. Y well, yes, and I, I don't think it was about the money for them so much as it was that I had reached a level of success. I had and done something special with my life. Yeah, they had exactly. always encouraged me to, to, to want to, to be exceptional in some way, mm -hmm. to not settle for mediocrity. Uh, the, the money would come, you know, if mm -hmm. I followed those other pursuits. Yeah. That, uh, so it wasn't so much about the money as it was about being successful and um, and doing something special and meaningful with my life, mm -hmm. and I I fortunately got to do it on a grand stage <laughs> where uh -huh. uh, the public could see it. Yeah. yeah, see, this is why I like theories because theories is just a way of entering into some somebody's life. It's like, yes, that may have happened, but also was the factor that your parents were proud of your success. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they were. A and in in family therapy, they say we need the permission from our parents, the blessing. Yes. To be who we want to be. That's right. That's so right. your parents were giving you the blessing. And be. I've always felt the need to have their blessing. Uh -huh. um, and then once my parents passed away, I have felt and continue to feel the need to have mm -hmm. my children's blessing. Mm -hmm. I want my children to be proud of me and to admire me. I want my grandchildren mm -hmm. to, um, and I, I, that's probably why that one conversation with my daughter Jessica has such a profound effect on my ability to to quit gambling and mm -hmm. to change the, the mm -hmm. path I was on. Uh, because 
um, having the respect and the admiration and the unconditional love of my children meant more to me than trying to win my money back. Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> it is very profound. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's been an interesting life and it's, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I feel very fortunate and very blessed, frankly, that uh, even at this point in my life, where, you know, turning 72 uh, in July, um, I'm still gainfully employed in a, at a job I really enjoy. Um, and I still have the energy and the, um, I guess the, the, the drive um, yeah. to continue looking for new opportunities. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have now published my memoir. I, I want to write another book. Um, I'm doing a lot of public speaking mm -hmm. now. Uh, what, which is how we met. <laughs> yeah, this is how yeah. we met. The so even if I don't uh -huh. remain in television uh, much longer, because mm -hmm. most people who are in my profession <laughs> have retired before this age, mm -hmm. uh, I'm still um, excited and enthusiastic about yeah. looking for new opportunities. Uh -huh. So you are going around public speaking. Yes. Doing and uh, uh, what, what is your book about that? So Can the, you share? The, yes, the book is called You Bet Your Life. No, the yeah. one that you are going oh, to Oh, the write. next book. Uh, oh, you uh, don't? I, I, don't well, I don't have a title for it yet, but it's going to be based on my real life experiences. So it's uh -huh. nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, it's about my own life experiences. Um, and I'm writing a lot about the role that, that humor has played mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, my, both of my parents, uh, I, th I think many people who face adversity uh, use humor as a, mm -hmm. a tool for dealing yes. with it. So I, I saw that in my parents in a lot of difficult situations. They would rely on humor to give them the strength. To I truly believe in humor. Yeah. I yeah. truly believe in the healing power of humor. That's it, the healing power mm -hmm. of humor, yeah. yeah. So a lot of what I'm writing now is, is about that, but I haven't, um, I haven't come up with a, a focus, yet a clear enough focus that I could give you mm -hmm. a title for the book. Uh -huh. No, it's, no, it's, I, we don't need a title, yeah. we need a topic. <laughs> it's a topic, yeah, yeah well, it's a topic. It's, topic. it's about the role that humor has played in my life mm -hmm. and how you can have a, a healthy balance between humor and seriousness. Yeah. You know, a, a person who has a great sense of humor isn't necessarily a silly, shallow person. Mm -hmm. You can be a person of great intellectual depth and, and have a very serious a view of life and at the same time you can have a laugh and not take yourself too seriously. In this podcast, Christian, um, we, Spencer, sorry, Mr. That's okay. Christian, <laughs> I got to say Mr. Christian. It's Chris okay. Spencer, in this podcast is, we, we take so deep, serious topics yeah. that we need to take it with sense of humor. I think so. It's a balance, like we, we talk about suicide, we talk about sexual abuse, we talk about the most painful human experiences, trauma, that sometimes uh, Brenda and I, we just need to laugh. Yes. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's so just important. like, what, what I always say, no matter what, no matter what I saw, people, I have been working with people who have been group raped, like, like difficult, very difficult lives. I always see them laughing. Yes. Again. That's true. I always, when we work, when there is the space, when it's the safe space, they laugh. Yeah, it's so true. I, I think that's, um, throughout the ages, I think people who have faced great adversity or persecution mm -hmm. uh, or painful experiences, mm -hmm. as you said, uh, in many cases, they have been able to survive that and gain strength from mm -hmm. finding humor in, in their circumstances. So I am going to be brave and say that humor may also help you to overcome Absolutely. the gambling. No doubt about that. Humor mm -hmm. has definitely, I've, uh, humor has been a part of my uh, character, my personality, if you will, my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, I think many people uh, define humor too narrowly. They, mm -hmm. they see humor as the ability to laugh or the ability to enjoy a joke. Uh, humor is also the ability to laugh at yourself yeah. and not take yourself too seriously yes. or your circumstances too seriously. Sometimes I define humor also the ability to see light, to be light about yourself. Yes, yes. To, to be relaxed about yourself. That's right. Like, yes, um, we did this mistake today. That yeah, I am in the recovery process. Yeah, uh, well, mm -hmm. I need to start all over. Yeah. The people, well, I, I speak to a lot of uh, students, college students, mm -hmm. high school students, and they ask questions like, um, when, you, when you make a mistake on the air, do you feel embarrassed? Mm -hmm. And I say, if I make a mistake on the air, I acknowledge the mistake and I laugh at myself. Mm -hmm. uh, because if I get tense and uptight about the mistake, then the 
people watching me, the viewers, will feel uncomfortable. But if I, if I show that, I'm un, that I am comfortable with mm -hmm. my own mistake, I can laugh at it and move on, yeah. then they can laugh too. They can laugh. Yeah. Oh, we have been, my <laughs> star and I, we have been doing Facebook Live for almost two years. Yeah. Facebook Live is for mistakes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We I have know. cats, we <laughs> have children, we have people n knocking <laughs> on the door, we have right. everything. What do we do? Yep. Laugh. Yeah, yeah, what else can you do, right? Last time, yeah, <laughs> Maestra Brenda, we have, <laughs> we were finishing the topic almost, and somebody ring the bell, and ring the bell, and ring the bell, and we were like, eh, <laughs> bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So humor yeah. is another sense of, another tool for healing. It, uh, it is a tool for healing. It's a great tool for healing. And, um, and you know, it's er everyone, uh, all of my family members the, who've been the closest people to me, my mm -hmm. parents, my brother, I have one sibling, uh, my children, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've been married twice, both of my wives, all of the people who have meant the most to me, um, even in the, the most difficult times, have also uh, it, uh, appreciated humor mm -hmm. and, and its healing role. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I can't get away from it. <laughs> Probably you have this sense of being so lucky, but I am going to... to 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 tell you that um, what I think about your experience in your life is yes you were through this very painful situation of gambling but you were also kind of protected by the love mm -hmm. by your own sense of humor by your own discipline um, many many people around uh, uh, Spencer they don't make it it's true a lot of suicide a lot of depression he very heavy depression um, they don't make it. I know. If only they had the love and support yeah. that, that I had. So many people are just facing their problems yeah. alone. Yes. With, with no one to, to lean on, no one to talk to, mm -hmm. no one to give them that unconditional love. And this is what keeps me going in this, uh, in, in this work. Because it's like if they can have this video or this audio and yeah. listen again and again, Hopefully, we can make them not to feel or feel less lonely. Yes, th I think that's so important. Yeah, y uh, you don't want people to feel lonely or mm -hmm. isolated. That's one of the reasons I wrote this book. Yes. I wanted to share my struggles w yeah. as a public person with the world, yes. so people will know that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. That's the message: you are not alone. Uh, no matter where you come from in life, no matter yeah. what you know position you reach in life, we all have problems mm -hmm. and struggles and fears and uncertainty. You are not alone, and I'm going to share with you the struggles I had mm -hmm. and the and the fears I had, uh, and I'm going to share them with you honestly. Yes. Because I hope that can help. And you did an amazing job on that. Thank you. Because Thank you. as I was reading, it's like I can see, it, it's not only about gambling, it's about being human. Yeah. It's like I can see definitely I have been having my flaws, and I am working for it, and I am working. So it gives me hope, your book. Yeah, <laughs> well, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. If my book gives you hope, then I feel like I've mm -hmm. accomplished something. Yeah. Uh, that's what I want uh, this book to achieve. Yeah. Uh, it was a cathartic experience for me writing yeah. the book. It relieved me of my shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that selfish purpose of helping me feel better yeah. about myself, uh, I want to encourage and inspire mm -hmm. other people and give them hope. What do you see, what do you wish for, for, I am going to put together my question. Imagine all of these people who is going to the casinos right now or uh, roster fighting, uh, in probably in Mexico is fighting with the rosters or yes. whatever gambling it is. Yeah. Um, what do you wish for them? Well, uh, I wish for people to have enough uh, self-awareness that they mm -hmm. can be honest with themselves okay. and recognize when they've reached the point where their gambling is a problem, where they mm -hmm. they are out of control. Um, I I had periods of of uh, that kind of recognition where I I knew deep down inside that I needed to quit, but uh, my pride got in the way. I I didn't want to uh, admit that I didn't have this under control. I didn't want people to see me as being foolish. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted, because I think most people who knew me thought I was a fairly smart guy, I, I didn't want to have them uh, say, ah, he had me fooled all the time. He's, he's stupid, he's dumb. Look at what he's done with his life. Um, so get, 
you have to get over that. You, you need to, if you've got a gambling problem, uh, you need to find someone you can confide in, someone you can talk to, but first you have to be honest with yourself mm -hmm. and acknowledge the problem before mm -hmm. you can acknowledge it to someone else. Yeah, wow, honest, honesty. Honesty, transparency. Transparency. Yeah. Uh, Getting courage. yourself, like pulling yourself to get help. Yeah. And help, I, I, something I, I love what you say, I love my profession, mm -hmm. but I don't think so only a psychologist can help you. Right. It can be your friend, it can be a, a spiritual leader, it can be... Yeah, it can be a friend, it can be a, a, a family member, uh -huh. a, a spouse, a sibling, uh, mm -hmm. a colleague at work, someone you trust. Yeah. Uh, if you're a person of faith, a, a, you know, a, uh -huh. a minister, mm -hmm. a, 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 someone you trust, you feel you can open up to, someone who's not going to be judgmental, yes. someone who's still going to accept you, yeah. and care about you, but uh -huh. who will listen. Yeah. Um, that's what I wish for, for uh -huh. people with addiction we have two minutes and I would like to give you the two minutes so you can say do whatever okay well so what what you want to say is it has been an amazing conversation <laughs> well, thank you well uh, it's been an amazing opportunity for me mm -hmm. because uh, I really seriously um, want uh, my life all facets of my life to serve as an example mm -hmm. for other people uh, of how we can find strength and courage to overcome all kinds of difficulty in life. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, th there's something I'd like to read from the book very quickly. Uh, it, won't go take ahead. it won't take two minutes. Yeah. Um, but I think it's on page 119. Um, I have my own quotes. Okay, so. all right. But, uh, and mm -hmm. as we, if we're running out of time, please let me know. Uh -huh. But basically what I say is, um, I want my life to serve as a source of comfort and inspiration for people facing challenges and difficulty of any time. No matter where we come from or what station we achieve in life, no one enjoys perfect peace. No one is without worry, fear, pain, anxiety, or self-doubt. Everyone experiences sadness, heartbreak, failure, embarrassment, and uncertainty. In many ways, the human condition is frail and flawed, yet in many other ways, the human spirit is strong, resilient, hopeful, and resourceful. So. Uh, I, I want people who have all kinds of problems to know that um, you, if you find the courage and the, str and the strength to confront those problems, you can repair damaged relationships, you can rebound, and you can recover. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, It's Spencer. been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> We have reached the end of another episode of the podcast Emotions in Harmony. See you the next week. Visit www emotionsinharmony.org where you can subscribe, find the notes, and be in direct contact with me. Thanks for listening.